Thank you all so much for having me. I, I <laughs> was joking a little bit with myself earlier that I'm really quite honored as a biologist to be invited to speak at the astronomy meeting, <laughs> at the astronomy talks. Um, I have my background in um, amphibian biology and conservation biology, hence DJ Amphibious. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been to Barton Springs here in Austin. All right, you have swam in the one place on Earth where the endangered species that I studied lives, the Barton Springs salamander. So if you haven't been there, please go check it out. Uh, it's a pretty great place, and you're swimming with an endangered endemic salamander that lives right there and nowhere else on Earth. Um, well, I wanted to introduce you first to Art Science Gallery. We're an art gallery in East Austin, just a few blocks east of here on Springdale Road and we merge art with science uh, with the primary objective of introducing people to the sciences through the visual arts. Oh, we're advancing. We should not be advancing yet. Because <laughs> I want to show you this short movie that just introduces you to a little bit about the idea behind merging art with science to communicate science uh, to the public. that's inspired by science. The art-science connection comes out of being a student of ecology and natural history and always looking for interactions and connections between things. So this is the Join Our Evolution group show and we have work here by 27 different artists from eight states around the country. And we have over 50 works of art here in this space. Art with a science spin is a little bit off the mainstream. We want to provide a space to celebrate science art. So the collage pieces are part of this project called the Darwin Day Portrait Project. We cut out all of these different pieces of paper from National Geographic magazines. Everyone who visited got to put some pieces of biodiversity onto the portrait of Darwin. The piece behind me is about weather and how climate is changing in central Texas. All the different squares represent different days of the year and the high and low temperatures on those days and then the amount of rainfall. Lindsay Nan Wolf does portraits of different scientists, so she has a portrait here of Tesla. And the inked animal work are impressions of animals. They work a lot with roadkill and trying to capture the spirit of, of these animals. You know, it's okay for scientists to be creative. A lot of scientists in their jobs don't get an opportunity to do art or it has to be kind of relegated to a hobby. We don't think that it needs to be that way. But we want to be a place that celebrates art science fusion it's where artists and scientists can basically hang out together and learn more about what each other's doing to help make the world a better place. So that's a quick introduction to the gallery, and I really want to thank KLRU for putting that together a couple of years ago during West Austin Studio Tour. And you'll notice in that uh, little video, there's a lot of work about biology that just happens to be my background, but I'm really excited to tell you about our first uh, show of artwork about the cosmos called Cosmic. Um, it just opened on Saturday, or sorry, on Friday, and it's gonna be up until February 20th. So I invite all of you to come just around the corner here on Springdale Road to check it out whenever you can. We're open Tuesday through Saturday, 12 to six o'clock. Um, and there are a few special events that I wanna invite you to before I get started talking about uh, astronomy-inspired artwork. Um, coming up on January 30th, oh, we must have some automatic timer here, but on January 30th, we've got live music in the gallery with printmaker and musician Dana Falconberry and the Night Blooms. February 6th, we have a science print pop-up shop, so we're gonna have several printmakers in the shop uh, showing you their science-inspired prints. It's part of a citywide printmaking festival called Print Austin that runs through February 15th. And then uh, the show closes on February 20th, and we're doing a new thing for 2016. We're showing short films at the end of each exhibit. So we're doing Far Out Films uh, screening. That's a free event on February 20th at seven o'clock. That's the last day to see the Cosmic Show as well. So I hope you'll all come and check those out. And you can RSVP or get tickets to any of those events at artsciencegallery.eventbrite.com. So let's get on to the astronomy-inspired artwork. Um, obviously, as astronomical observations have been made for millennia, and um, this is one fairly early and fairly neat uh, tapestry that I found um, showing the com what's now known as the uh, uh, Halley's Comet. Um, this is an embroidered cloth uh, dating from about 1070, and you can see uh, people making astronomical observations um, in this artwork here. Um, moving on to Galileo's work, um, 
In the early 1600s, he did one of the first realistic depictions of the moon in these watercolors um, that actually became quite famous. And um, you can view this and a lot of other really interesting um, observations by him uh, in the Galileo Museum. This is another really interesting depiction of the moon. This is by a photographer, a German photographer, Julius Grimm. Um, and he combined his uh, photographic works with uh, real-time observations of the moon that he made uh, through a telescope to create a fairly large-scale oil painting um, of the moon. And using that oil painting medium, he was able to actually, to literally create relief on the, on the painting, um, showing all of the craters uh, on the moon, and, um, and actually had an arrow on one of the sides of the painting uh, where a light was supposed to be shown, and that, that um, arrow where the light was supposed to be shown would cast realistic shadows from those craters onto the surface uh, of the moon, of the moon painting. Um, Il Truvolo is, I think, a really fascinating um, space artist or astronomical artist. He created over 7,000 illustrations of astronomical phenomenon during his career. Um, th that's a lot of illustrations. Um, most of these were made um, using real observations through telescopes. Um, and in 1872, he was hired by Harvard College Observatory um, to be one of their official artists. Um, this particular illustration of sunspots and veiled spots were a discovery of his. He discovered veiled, veiled spots. Um, he also was invited by the U.S. Naval Observatory um, in 1875 to spend an entire year on their 26-inch uh, refractor telescope to do nothing but look at whatever he wanted and make illustrations, which sounds like a great job to me. Um, moving forward a little bit, so the, the ones that I've shown previously, the artwork that I've shown previously is using art to uh, record and observe astronomical phenomenon. But it can also be used um, to try to depict or visualize what we can't see yet, what we can really only imagine or theorize about. Um, and that's one of the really, I think, amazing qualities of artwork and creativity and, and one of the most important roles of artists in, in astronomical art is helping to visualize the as yet unvisualized um, in astronomy. So Chesley Bonestell was a pretty popular and pretty prolific um, artist. And these are from the mid 19 uh, mid 1900s, um, and they were actually illustrations for science fiction novels. He was he was mainly known for illustrating science fiction, um, but a fairly realistic scene. So he basically was asked to imagine what would Saturn look like as seen from its different moons. And these are two of the illustrations that he made. He also um, worked uh, for films, for science fiction films. He did um, some of the background paintings for films like War of the Worlds. Um, and through his work, he actually helped to um, popularize uh, the crewed space missions um, and um, helped generate a lot of public support for that kind of thing. So here is Saturn as seen from Mimas. Jumping forward to 2015, I have an artist that's here in the room right now. Will you give us a wave, Jedediah? He's over there in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> And this is actually one of my favorite prints from what he calls his Stellar Science Series. Um, these are produced by his art studio, Ink and Sword. Um, and kind of building on, um, on what Bonestell did in, in terms of uh, how Bonestell uses art to inspire uh, space exploration, um, Ink and Sword says it best, uh, these retro style inspirational prints reflect back to an era where a trip to the moon was not just the pinnacle of human achievement, but it was the coolest thing in the universe to be an astronaut, explorer, or scientist, and I quite agree. So you can see a lot more uh, illustrations in this series right back there at our, at our table tonight, but you can also see them at the gallery. So there's Stay Curious, the very cute uh, Curiosity rover. And one of the very newest in the Stellar Science series, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So there are a lot of different spacecraft and space probes illustrated in this Stellar Science series um, that I think really bring across the excitement of what we're doing uh, in astronomy in the past and today. And Jedediah has also created, now getting into some of the work from the Cosmic Show that you can see at Art Science Gallery, 
um, a really fantastic set of lino prints um, based on Polynesian explorers. Um, and Polynesian uh, wayfinders, the navigators, um, have been using celestial bodies to navigate um, for a very, very long time. And this series of four prints, I'm showing two of you, uh, two of them to you tonight, a series of uh, four prints um, helps to represent how those uh, navigators um, uh, found their way across the Pacific Ocean to different island chains using, uh, using celestial bodies as one of the ways that they, that they navigated. Um, the Polynesian wayfinders actually um, thought of a compass around the boats with 32 hale or um, or houses uh, around them. And you can see some of those here in this series of prints, four prints, there are eight of the Halles represented on each of these, uh, of these prints. And each of those Halles was represented by um, a star cluster or um, some other kind of celestial object. Um, and so this one is actually showing uh, Maui snaring the sun and it's showing uh, the Kite of Cavello constellation um, on top of it. So he's actually depicted some of the major constellations representing that section um, of the celestial compass on these prints. Uh, this is another, the Baylor of Makali'i. And um, the star cluster on this one is uh, one that you and I would probably call Pleiades. And on this one also you've got um, a depiction of Tiki, the first uh, man. So do you guys remember the last slide in the immediately previous talk? It looked a little bit like this. This is a print by, this is a mana print uh, with gold leaf by Kathy Savage uh, called, uh, titled Dark Matter. So we really wanted to include this one, of course, in an evening of so much great information uh, about dark, mat dark matter. Um, and in her artist statement, Kathy Savage describes uh, this print as trying to depict the cosmic web of gas that stretches between galaxies. We also have a couple of, uh, we have a lot of free bookmarks over there that has an image of this on it. So if you really like this image, you can take home uh, a little copy of it for yourself. And another really prolific printmaker and a person whose work we've shown a lot of at Art Science Gallery over the last three years that we've been around is Ellie Willoughby. She is a marine geophysicist um, and a printmaker. Um, she lives up in Toronto, so there's a lot of dark matter, as we all remember, <laughs> um, up there. She's probably an expert at this point. Um, but she does a really great portrait series of a lot of different scientists. I've chosen to show you so, just some of the astronomers, and I have actual prints of these back there if you'd like to take a look at them up close to see the details. Um, here's Copernicus um, with his model of, a, of the solar system, the heliocentric system, and holding Lily of the Valley, which is a symbol of um, medical philosophers or medical doctors uh, at that at that time. And next, uh, Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Uh, Swan Leavitt um, is famous for uh, her discoveries of stellar period luminosity, um, and these measurements help us to measure now the distance between celestial objects. Um, and then depicted below are some of the major constellations that she studied uh, uh, when she was making these discoveries. And finally, for the portraits, this is uh, Jocelyn Bell and the LGM-1, or the Little Green Men 1. Um, Jocelyn Bell uh, was the discoverer of the first radio pulsar, uh, which emits regular pulses of electromagnetic radiation, which you can see uh, throughout this model. And also, I think, one of, probably one of the more famous stories of uh, a woman getting burned for a Nobel Prize, uh, which was awarded to her advisor because he was first author on the paper. <laughs> Um, but Ellie has created a couple of really amazing um, prints for the Cosmic Show. Um, this one is called Turtles All the Way Down. This is a linoleum block print with chincolé or collaged prints representing each of the turtle shells. Um, and Ellie, another thing I really like about her work is that she writes uh, the greatest artist statements. She's just got a really great narrative style when she writes these, so I actually want to tell you her artist statement in her own words. Um, so the story behind this one turtles all the way down. 
In cosmology, there is an expression, turtles all the way down, which relates to a well-known anecdote and a metaphor for the problem of infinite regress. There are many versions of the anecdote. It appears famously in Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, amongst other sources. The story goes that a physicist, after explaining the origins of our planet, is confronted by a disgruntled audience member who claims this is nonsense. The Earth is, according to him or her, supported by a great turtle. When the physicist asks about what supports the turtle, the answer is a larger turtle, of course. When the physicist persists and asks, physicist persists and asks what supports the next turtle, why, it's turtles all the way down, of course. <laughs> so you can see here, um, all of the turtles that she's shown and the thing I love about this print as a biologist is that these are all actual species of turtles very realistically depicted. Um, it starts at the top with the eastern mud turtle, a red-eared slider, a black pond turtle, a painted badiger, and a Oaxacan mud turtle followed by at the bottom uh, a green sea turtle or Chelonia midas. So Ellie has put the biology in here too which, which I really love. Um, and the last one I'd like to show you from the show is also by Ellie Willoughby. Um, and this one she calls No Space Time. And again, I'm going to read you her, uh, her statement. And those of you in the room who have, are familiar with space time diagrams probably recognize what's going on here. Um, but here's her statement for this one. Years ago, I stumbled upon a book about No and used in a used bookstore. I collect masks and I'm interested in Japanese culture, so I bought No, a classical theater. I was very surprised to read how the author described the difference between the men and women characters and the supernatural beings uh, not of this world in Phantasmal No. The humans lived in a 3D world and the other worldly characters like demons live in a 4D world. As a physicist, I know that we all actually live in three spatial dimensions with a fourth dimension of time. This would mean that a supernatural no character would have access to a fifth dimension, four spatial dimensions in time. What surprised me even more was the explanation of this fourth spatial dimension of spirits, which is, quote, not for the purpose of setting up positions in time and space as we know them. So she's so shown here the no masks of the demon and the man and woman uh, on a space-time diagram. So for the rest of the cosmic pieces, I invite you to come to Art Science Gallery and see them. We've got wonderful works by Carrie, Car Carrie Carlson as well, um, Jennifer Lynch from Taos, New Mexico, uh, Laura Moriarty from Kingston, New York, uh, and Nicole Geary from San Antonio, and Ruthie Powers from Austin, Texas. So there are a lot more pieces in that show that you can come and see. Um, we also have uh, a lot of really fun upcoming classes um, and we're always looking for great teachers so if you have maybe an astronomy themed class you'd like to teach for us we're looking for great teachers for us in the summertime um, and you know all of these you can ask us more about tonight or um, or come and visit us at the gallery the cross street uh, it's at Springdale Road 916 Springdale Road which is between East 7th and Airport so from here, you'd go down 7th Street, turn left on Springdale, and we'll be on the left. Uh, and we also have an online shop that's now open at artsciencegallery.com shop. And I would be happy to take any questions about art. And I'll ask my physics friends and my astronomy friends to help me out with any astronomy-related questions you have about the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Questions for DJ Amphibious. <laughs> right here. Yeah. What was your research on for the salamanders? My, the question is, what was my research on for the salamanders? I did a few studies, uh, one on population demographics. The city of Austin collected this really rad 11-year-long time series data set of salamander population size. So I analyzed that to try to figure out what environmental variables affect salamander population size. Um, I also did some experiments on uh, how they detect their predators, whether it's through smell, electrosensation, or vision. Uh, yeah, so those are the major things. <laughs> right there. Uh, how long have y'all been open? Uh, this is our third year. So the video that you saw was from very early days when the gallery was actually in my house. And we did, an, we did a crowdfunding campaign to get money to move into our space where we are now about three years ago mm -hmm. right there yeah yes uh, 
That's a good question. The question is, again, about salamanders. And, and the question is, um, they only live in, you know, how they only live in one space in Martin Springs and nowhere else. Is it possible that they could be transported somewhere else where they would do just as well um, and thrive there? Uh, the answer is it's possible to do that there, but there are actually many other species of similar salamander in central Texas in the same genus, the genus is Eurycia. And um, if you transported Barton spring salamanders to another spring where they might live just fine, they would be competing with another very similar species there. And they could, we're not sure if they could, but they could possibly also hybridize with the other species. Therefore, uh, you know, muddying the waters between what is one species and another. <laughs> yeah. yeah, friend here. How do they find their prey? I actually studied how they find their, how they detect their predators and how the salamanders detect their predators um, is a combination of olfactory sensation and electrosensation. It's a little bit less vision because they have pretty myopic vision. They can't see very far and All they right. live under rocks <laughs> where it's dark. All right, one more question right here. <laughs> Good salamander questions, you guys. <laughs> other that the question is other than blindness, what is the difference between the Texas blind salamander and the Barton Springs salamander? Um, well, one is that they live in very different segments of the uh, of the aquifer. Um, the Texas blind salamander is much larger. It can be about this large at a maximum size. It has a much bigger kind of sp spoon-shaped head and um, its skin is really kind of a white purple iridescent, whereas the Barton Spring sal salamander is much smaller. It only gets about this big at its maximum length. It's more brown with mottled spots. Um, it also lives at the surface of springs, so underneath rocks at the very surface of springs, so at the bottom of a stream, whereas the Texas blind salamander lives exclusively in the subterranean habitat and doesn't usually come up to the surface where we see them very often. All right, let's thank DJ Amphibious <laughs> one more time. Thank you.